Welcome to our Bible study for Sunday the 28th of February, being the second Sunday of Lent. And we begin in chapter 17 of Genesis, in which we encounter the Lord uh, and Abraham entering into a covenant. Now, there are deliberate echoes going on in this passage with the covenant that we heard last week between the Lord and Noah, between the Lord and all creation. Here we see the covenant described with the word itself, covenant, appearing 13 times in chapter 17. Uh, the Lord says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. In other words, these verses refer to uh, the promise of relation with God, and then Abraham is going to receive the promise of progeny, that he is going to have descendants. Uh, the verses uh, describe that the initiative for the covenant is with God. But there's a reciprocal relationship between God and Abraham established. Uh, the very term for covenant in Hebrew, berit, implies a mutuality in relationship. God himself introduces himself as God Almighty. This is a title popular with one of the priestly writers of the Torah, and uh, this title, El Shaddai, uh, basically means God Almighty. It is not commonly used in the Old Testament. This is one of the examples where it is. We get another name change, however, here from Abraham being Abram to Abraham. And this is linked with the promise of progeny of descendants. Because while Abram or Abram refers to the fatherhood of the individual, the fatherhood of Abram, uh, the change implies father of a multitude. Basically, we get Ab Ha Amon in Hebrew, becoming Abraham, and so father of a multitude. Now, let's link those two covenants that we've had in the last week and this week. The first was with the Lord and Noah and his sons and all creation, the so-called Noachitic or Noachian covenant, that God makes a promise of mutual relationship with all creation, that he will set his bow in the clouds. Now we have a promise being established with Abraham, but note that even the change of name implies that this goes forth from Abraham to the multitude. Uh, we are going to later learn, both in terms of the Lord's interactions with Abraham and as described by Jesus Christ, that Abraham is to be the father of many nations and that all nations shall be blessed through him, through his relationship with the Lord. This point is re-emphasized in our lessons in the psalm. We have verses 22 through 30 from Psalm 22. Now, we're most familiar with Psalm 22 from Holy Week. Uh, it is used at the stripping of the altar. The entire psalm is used at the stripping of the altar on Monday, Thursday. And we also see, there's the water bottle, we also see that it is used on Good Friday. We're familiar with the beginning of the psalm from the Passion accounts in Mark and in Matthew, where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That's the first line of Psalm 22. And the psalm as a whole is a lament. And so there's been some debate in the church as to whether Jesus is truly despairing on the cross or whether he just dies before he gets to the end of the psalm where there's a note of triumph. Or whether he actually is experiencing real despair. The vast majority of 
commentators throughout the centuries have said Jesus is experiencing real despair, real abandonment, because he experiences the totality of human experience. That there is no experience we can have that Jesus does not experience, that he may lift it up. Indeed, this is why we confess in the creed that he descended into hell. Now, uh, the psalm as a whole, as I said, is an individual lament. Uh, the verses here are an invitation to join in the praise of God. Uh, and we culminate this praise with a universal chorus of praise. The invitation to Israel, in other words, is extended to all people, which takes us back to through Abraham, through Israel in other words, shall all people be blessed. The pairing of these verses with the verses we had from Genesis suggests that the mutuality of the Lord's covenant with Abraham has been extended to all peoples, which it has through Jesus Christ. But we get a dimension of time entering here. Uh, there's a reference to all who sleep in the earth, all who slumber in the earth, all who go down to the dust, all, uh, and also a people yet unborn. In other words, we get the past linked with the future by and through those who pray the psalm in the present. Uh, we can compare this with the overall timelessness of covenant throughout the Bible. We get a reference here in the last verse to the saving deeds of the Lord. Uh, and this is an echo back to line one, why have you forsaken me? The initial concept in Hebrew is why are you so far from saving me? That's how the psalm starts and it ends reciting the saving deeds of the Lord. God keeps his promises. We move on to chapter 4 in Paul's letter to the Romans, and Paul is teaching that the Christian is justified by faith, here illustrated by him with examples from the Old Testament, this particular one being the story of Abraham. Now, the point Paul is setting up in his overall argument in Romans is that the law may be good and just and holy, but the law will not save us. And so when Paul talks about being justified, he's going to make the point that we can't be justified by the law, nor was Abraham. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Paul talks about the Lord establishing a covenant with Abraham, Abraham believing the Lord, and this being reckoned to him as righteousness. But when we pay attention, the first thing we notice is that this righteousness of Abraham is reckoned to him before the law has been established. There is no Ten Commandments. There is no Leviticus. There is no law at the time that Abraham is reckoned as righteous. That's the point Paul is making here. The promise of God, of an heir, and of numerous posterity is independent of the law. The blessings which flow to Abraham accrue not because he observes the law, because there is no law yet. If the only condition to being an inheritor of God's blessing was to the observance of the law, then faith would mean nothing. In fact, the prescriptions of the law are honored more in the breach, which is why we see wrath. And therefore, since the law and faith cannot exist side by side, one has to yield, and faith is paramount. This is essentially Paul's argument. Now, Abraham's faith becomes a type of Christian faith. As we've discussed in the past, a type is something that arises in the Old Testament that foreshadows its fulfillment in the New Testament. So Abraham, believing in God despite having no real earthly reason to do so, he believes in God because he knows who God is, is a type of the Christian faith that despite persecution, despite worldliness, 
those who identify with Jesus Christ and have faith in him are justified through this faith because Jesus, being the righteous one, can fulfill the law, can stand before the judgment seat while himself being the judge. And therefore, as we are identified in Christ, we are deemed righteous through his righteousness. Just as Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, our faith allows us to stand before God. <clears throat> now, in the gospel, we see another important pivot, pivot going on. You'll recall that first we had Peter confessing who Jesus is. You are the Messiah. Last week, we had the uh, transfiguration. That's the last Sunday, actually. That's the last Sunday after Epiphany, the first Sunday before Lent. We had the transfiguration. Now we kind of go backwards a little bit. And we have Jesus rebuking Peter after he has confessed him to be the Christ. What happens is they're walking along and Jesus predicts his passion. He has turned to Jerusalem. He predicts his passion. And Peter essentially says, let this never happen, Lord. This is when Jesus famously says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God's will, but on the side of men. What's going on? And how does this fit into the overall narrative arc of the story? Peter's just confessed that Jesus is God's anointed. And then right after rebuking Peter that he has set his mind not on divine things, but on human things, then Jesus takes Peter and James and John up to the mountain and is transfigured before them. And they hear the Father's voice saying, this is my beloved Son. In other words, we are to understand that human beings cannot define what God's plan will be. Jesus has told Peter and the disciples what God's plan is, that he's going to be handed over to the chief priests and sacrificed. Peter has said, let this not be. Jesus has rebuked him in the strongest possible terms and then takes them up on the high mountain where God's plan is revealed. Jesus, in effect, clarifies that he is the Christ in his first prediction of the Passion. And in the face of Peter's rejection of the need for suffering, Jesus affirms that not only must the Messiah suffer, but that those who follow him must deny themselves and take up their own cross. Self-denial is necessary. Losing one's life for the gospel is salvific. The true self, that is, identification with God, is far more valuable than any assumed good. And so this mutuality and covenant becomes a mutuality in how human beings relate to the Son of Man, the Son of God, and how this Son will relate to the disciple at the last judgment. As the Master goes, so must the disciple go. Uh, now, a real ring of authenticity in this Gospel passion is Jesus comparing Peter to Satan. Let's think about this for a minute. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that you were trying to make stuff up and start a new religion and make this itinerant preacher in first century Palestine into a lot more than he might have been. If you go with the cultural narrative in a lot of the world around us, which was the cultural narrative in a lot of the world around Peter and James and John, you hear people say, well, you know, Jesus was this really good teacher, but he never claimed to be God. That was just the church making stuff up, and it was about power. There are all kinds of evidences against that, but we get one here. If you were going to make stuff up, would you take the leader of your new movement, Peter, and would you have the founder of this movement, Jesus, refer to him as Satan and act like he's an idiot. 
that would go against any interest in propaganda. If you were going to make stuff up, would you include details that would be certain to make pagans to dismiss you as crazy, such as the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, such as the resurrection of the dead. And if you were going to make stuff up, would you be prepared to die for that lie as all of the original disciples were prepared and 11 of them did? Would you be prepared for that? These are all marks of real authenticity. These are all marks of being so identified with Jesus as to be reckoned righteous through him, but as to be in real mutual relationship with God. As we hear again and again throughout this Lenten season, how we must deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow Jesus. Let us not be frightened by any prospect of ridicule or suffering and recognize that as we may be ridiculed, as we may even suffer for Jesus' sake, we participate in his redemption of the world and in our own salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.